another shooting. In between the Hells Angel and a rival gang may have been in retaliation for murder. Members of the Hells Angels and police investigating the Hells Angels and hoping that this will wipe out the entire organization. Chapter have been Hells Angels. Hells Angels. Hells Angels. The Hells Angels. Hells Angels. The Hells Angels. If you're into motorcycles, the Hells Angels may ring a bell. Name any criminal activity and you can bet your bottom dollar that the Hells Angels were around. It's no wonder the FBI considers them one of the most violent motorcycle gangs in the world. And these are the 13 most dangerous Hells Angels in history. The Hells Angels don't have to actively recruit members. They want people that bring them value. Number 1. Maurice Mom Boucher June 21, 1953. Maurice Boucher was born in Cozumel, Quebec, Canada. He dropped out of school in the ninth grade, taking odd jobs. However, his income wasn't enough, and he found himself desperate to support his drug habit. This desperation led him down a path of crime. By 1982, Boucher had become a member of a white supremacist motorcycle gang called the SS. This affiliation caught the attention of the Hells Angels. But his entry into the club was temporarily halted when he was arrested for assaulting a young teenager. However, in late 1987, after completing his 40-month sentence, Boucher finally joined the Hells Angels Motorcycle Club in Montreal. He quickly climbed the ranks, and by the early 90s, he'd established himself as one of the most powerful bikers in the province. He was also involved in numerous lucrative criminal activities, such as cocaine trafficking and loan sharking. 1994, the arrest of Salvatore Gazzetta, the leader of Rock Machine, the Hells Angels' biggest rival, left the club without a leader for a while. Seeing a chance to make a move, Boucher, who'd become the president of the Montreal chapter, decided to take action against the Rock Machine and other independent drug dealers. His main objective was to establish the Hells Angels as the sole players in the drug trade in Montreal and eventually all across Quebec. Boucher organized efforts convincing rock machine controlled bars and drug dealers to surrender their illegal drug business. However, rock machine resisted, leading to violent confrontations and bloodshed. July 14, 1994. Two notorious hitmen from Hells Angels stormed into a motorcycle shop and ruthlessly gunned down a rock machine associate. Now, it was this incident that would ignite the infamous Quebec Biker War, a violent conflict waging on for eight long years until 2002, claiming the lives of 162 individuals. The bloodshed didn't stop there. The war was marked by a staggering number of 84 bombings and 130 arson cases. August 1994, a jeep rigged with a remote control bomb detonated, tragically taking the life of an innocent 11-year-old boy who happened to be playing in a nearby schoolyard. The violence continued a month later when a prominent Hells Angels member was ambushed and shot while entering his car at a shopping mall. Nine bombs also went off around the province during his funeral. And when 1995 rolled in, Boucher decided to establish a new chapter of Hells Angels, one that he would personally lead. This new faction, known as the Hells Angels Nomads Chapter, consisted of Quebec's most influential and powerful club members. Unlike other chapters in the group, this one wasn't confined by geographical boundaries, giving them even more freedom to wreak havoc. And now, after everything we've said about this man, you might think Maurice Boucher was unstoppable. But it was one fateful decision that ultimately sealed his fate. September 8, 1997. During a fierce war between the Hells Angels and Rock Machine, Boucher gave an order to kill Quebec correctional officers Diane Levine and Pierre Rondeau. These officers were chosen randomly. Boucher's intention was to strike a blow at the judicial system in Quebec, ensuring that prosecutors would be too afraid to strike deals with bikers to gather information. But that's not the end of the story. 1998, a jury actually acquitted Boucher of ordering those murders. However, this didn't deter the police from closely monitoring him. In 2000, an appeals court overturned the earlier acquittal, leading to his rearrest. May 2002, Boucher was finally convicted of the murders with the help of a police informant and was sent to Canada's only supermax security prison. 
As the verdict was read out, Boucher grinned, seemingly confident that prison wouldn't be able to tame him. And he was right. 2015, while still behind bars, Maurice Boucher was once again arrested and charged, this time for conspiring to assassinate Reynald Desjantins, an alleged close associate of the Montreal Mafia. And for many more years, Boucher remained one of Quebec's most feared crime bosses, even from within the confines of prison. However, there's one thing that doesn't bow down to anyone's power. Cancer. July 10th, 2022, Maurice Boucher passed away in the prison's hospital, marking the end of a brutal chapter in Hells Angels history. However, his most trusted hitman proved to be just as ruthless, if not more. Number 2. David Wolf Carroll April 1st, 1952, a folk legend was born in Dartmouth, Canada. His name was David MacDonald Carroll, but everyone knew him as Wolf. Growing up, Wolf found himself drawn to the wild side of life and ended up joining a biker gang called the 13th Tribe. Little did he know that this was just the beginning, for he caught the attention of none other than Maurice Boucher himself, who personally recruited Wolf to join the Hells Angels. And so Wolf made his way to Montreal and was entrusted with the responsibility of overseeing drug dealings in the Laurentians. He quickly rose through the ranks and became Boucher's most trusted hitman, rumored to have participated in a staggering number of 15 murders. However, Wolf's criminal activities didn't stop there. In the mid-1980s, he got caught running a prostitution ring in Montreal. Surprisingly, he only served a year in jail for this offense. But Wolf had no intention of returning to life behind bars and fate would prove that he would indeed live up to his word. Despite his criminal activities, Wolf was known for being intelligent and was considered a prominent figure in the Halifax chapter of the Hells Angels. He even wore the notorious Filthy Few patch, which symbolized willingness to murder for the sake of the club. During the Quebec Biker War, Carroll harbored intense hatred towards the Rock Machine Gang and was rumored to have killed several of their members. He also had personal feuds with fellow Hells Angel members and it was known for engaging in drug dealings in territories that belonged to others. Between 1995 and 2001, Wolf and two accomplices were accused of conspiring to murder members of rival motorcycle gangs who had reportedly refused to obtain drug supplies from Carol and the Hells Angels Nomads chapter. March 28, 2001, as part of a police operation named Springtime, a warrant was finally issued for Carol's arrest. He was charged with 13 counts of first-degree murder. At this time, Carroll was in Iztapa, Mexico, and so an extradition request was filed with the Mexican government for Wolf, along with two other Hells Angels, Eva Dubé and André Chouinard. Only Dubé was extradited while both Chouinard and Carroll managed to disappear. 22 years later, Wolf remains at large, and surprisingly for years, Wolf isn't the only Hells Angel who managed to play a catch-me-if-you-can game with the police. Number 3. Paul Eyscheid During the day, he was a clean-cut, well-dressed stockbroker from Arizona. However, when the sun went down and his suit and tie came off, Paul Merle Eyscheid transformed into one of America's most dangerous criminals eventually earning a spot on the U.S. Marshals' 15 Most Wanted list. October 27, 2001, the club was hosting its weekly church meeting, as they like to call it, and the gatherings always took place at the Mesa, Arizona Clubhouse. According to a former member, once the door was locked, the Hells Angels inside would fine-tune various illegal schemes, including selling methamphetamine. On that fateful night, Cynthia Garcia decided to hang out at the clubhouse, but only if she knew that this would be her final night out. As she partied with the Angels, the 44-year-old mother of six started badmouthing the club and its members. She was intoxicated and had no filter, which enraged the Hells Angels. They began brutally beating her. They mercilessly stomped on her while she lay defenseless on the clubhouse floor. Eventually, they threw the semi-conscious woman into the trunk of a car and drove off into the vast Arizona desert. Her body was found on Halloween. She had been stabbed nearly 30 times, and her killers had tried and failed to cut off her head. Two years after the murder of federal investigation known as Operation Black Biscuit, 
stormed into the Mesa chapter of the Hells Angels. Over a dozen members found themselves facing federal criminal charges, including drug trafficking and conspiracy. This investigation eventually led to murder charges against two members involved in the Garcia's case, one of whom was Paul Eyscheid. Surprisingly, despite the serious charges against him, the judge granted Eyscheid bail. His steady job as a stockbroker and relatively clean criminal record seemed to play a role in this decision. However, Paul had other plans and wasn't interested in sticking around for his day in court. July 29, 2004, Eyscheid vanished into thin air. That morning, he removed his ankle monitoring bracelet, said goodbye to his girlfriend, and escaped the country with the help of a fake passport provided by Robert Eugene Tudeke, a fella hell's angel. The former stockbroker turned gang member managed to evade capture until 2011, when Argentinian authorities finally apprehended him in Buenos Aires. During the arrest, Argentinian officials discovered a passport, an Arizona driver's license, and a social security number, all belonging to Tudeke, in Eyeshine's possession. Surprisingly, a Change.org petition was created, urging for Eyeshine to remain in Argentina instead of him being extradited to the U.S. The petition argued that he had a wife and son in the country, and that he would be tried for crimes he didn't commit if he was to be extradited. Despite gathering over 4,000 signatures, the petition ultimately had little to no impact. In 2018, Eyscheid returned to Arizona in handcuffs to face charges related to Garcia's murder. Now, the next angel on our list also did everything possible to avoid ending up in jail, but his actions eventually led to his downfall. Number 4. Adam Lee Hall August 2011, David Glasser and Edward Frampton were roommates in Pittsfield, Massachusetts. They were always hanging out with their buddy, Robert Chadwell. Frampton was a pretty active guy, playing basketball and participating in the Special Olympics. Chadwell was a counselor for teens struggling with drug and alcohol addiction. And Glasser was a well-liked member of the community. Unfortunately, their lives took a tragic turn when they crossed paths with Adam Lee Hall. Two years prior, Hall, a ranking member of the Massachusetts chapter of Hell's Angels, brutally attacked Glasser with a baseball bat because he suspected him of theft. Glasser, being the responsible citizen he was, reported the incident to the police. As a result, Hall wasn't only arrested for the assault, but also drug and gun charges. September 2011, both Hall and Glasser were scheduled to appear in court, with Glasser planning to testify against Hall. However, before this could happen, Glasser, Frampton, and Chadwell mysteriously vanished without a trace. These disappearances were reported to the police, who immediately focused their investigation on Glasser due to the danger he faced from testifying against Hall. After an exhausting 11-day search, the bodies of Glasser, Frampton, and Chadwell were finally discovered. In a gruesome sight, their dismembered remains were wrapped in plastic bags and buried in a pit. Autopsies later revealed that they had suffered unimaginable torture, being gutted and shot. The police believed Glasser was the intended target, while the other two unfortunate souls were in the wrong place at the wrong time. Hall and three of his accomplices were handed life sentences without the possibility of parole. At this point, we can see that messing with Hell's Angels is definitely not a smart move. But the thing is, when they're in the picture, even something as simple as going to a music concert can turn into a life or death situation. Number 5. Alan Pissarro December 6th, 1969, the Altamont Speedway Free Festival took place near Tracy, California. This counterculture rock concert was a big deal, featuring renowned musicians like Jefferson Airplane, The Grateful Dead, and The Rolling Stones. Around 300,000 people showed up, eagerly anticipating a great show. Now you would think with such a massive event, they would have top-notch security, right? Well, not quite. Instead of professional security or the police, the organizers made a deal with none other than the Hells Angels. The Angels were tasked with keeping the audience away from the stage in exchange for $500 worth of beer. They positioned themselves right in front of the bands, determined to prevent anyone from getting too close to the stage. They even used their motorcycles as a barrier. 
So far, so good. Sounds like a recipe for success. Now, as the day went on, the Hells Angels started drinking beer and, as you can imagine, became intoxicated. Meanwhile, the crowd grew restless and unpredictable. In this chaotic mix, the drunken Hells Angels began throwing full cans of beer and attacking concert goers with motorcycle chains and weighted pool cues. And by the time the Rolling Stones finally took the stage in the early evening, things had taken a dark turn. Fights broke out between the Hells Angels and the audience, creating a tense and hostile atmosphere. Sadly, the violence didn't spare anyone. Denise Jukes, a member of a local band, was struck in the head with an empty beer bottle thrown from the crowd, resulting in a skull fracture requiring emergency surgery. However, that was just the beginning of the chaos, as all hell was about to break loose. One of the attendees, Meredith Curley Hunter, climbed on top of a speaker box next to the stage, and two Hells Angels got in a scuffle with him. One of them grabbed Hunter's head, punched him, and chased him back into the crowd, where four more angels joined in the attack. After a few moments, Hunter angrily returned to the front of the stage. His girlfriend, Patty Bredehoff, tearfully found him and begged him to calm down and move further back into the crowd. She later reported that he was enraged, irrational, and so high that he could barely walk. In the concert footage, Hunter was seen pulling out what seems to be a 22 caliber revolver from his jacket and pointing it up in the air. That's when Hell's Angel Alan Passaro, armed with a knife, charged at Hunter from the side. Passaro deflected the gun with his left hand and stabbed Hunter with his right. Witnesses confirmed that Passaro managed to stab Hunter five times in the upper back. To make matters worse, while Hunter was on the ground, several Hell's Angels proceeded to stomp on him. Passaro was arrested and charged with murder. In his testimony, he claimed that he acted out of genuine belief that he was defending himself. Passaro never served time in prison. The jury agreed with the defense's argument that he acted in self-defense. But wow, I wonder what the threshold of stabs are to make it not count as self-defense. Rumors began circulating that the clash between the Hells Angels and Hunter originated from their prejudice against him. Apparently, they targeted him simply because he was a black man hanging out with a white woman. This wasn't entirely surprising, considering the Angels' notorious history of assaulting and mistreating people of color. However, it's important to note that Meredith Hunter wasn't the sole fan who tragically lost their lives at the concert. Two individuals were killed in hit-and-run car accidents, while another drowned in an irrigation canal. Passaro also met a similar fate a year after. He was discovered dead, dressed in a suit, and floating in the Anderson Reservoir with a whopping $10,000 in his pocket. The cause of death was determined to be drowning, though foul play was never confirmed. Number 6. George Wethern George Wethern grew up in Oakland, California. At the young age of 16, he dropped out of school and joined the Air Force. But his time in the service ended with an undesirable discharge. After leaving the Air Force, George joined Hell's Angels and quickly climbed the ranks, eventually becoming the chapter's vice president. This was largely due to his close friendship with President Sonny Barger. And although he left Hell's Angels around 1970, he still maintained contact with many members. However, it seems that once you're involved with the Hell's Angels, they never truly leave you. This became evident when three bodies were discovered on George Wethern's 156-acre ranch near Akaya in Northern California. Rumor has it that this property, believed to have been purchased with club funds, but registered under Wethern's name, was used to dispose of the bodies. The motive behind this gruesome act was supposedly a debt owed by Wethern to another angel named William Zorro Mitten. It's said that Weathern shot Mitten at a party while under the influence of drugs in 1969. Weathern left the ranch keys with William Mitten and was told to stay away from the property on a specific weekend. The bodies were found inside abandoned wells on the ranch. One of the victims was a young woman who had been shot in the head, while the other two were Hell's Angels attempting to stage a coup. According to William Whispering Bill Pfeiffer, a former angel turned informant, the victims had been given cups of coffee laced with LSD. Whispering Bill was serving time in Alameda County Jail in Oakland, California, was also battling cancer and knew he didn't have much time left. 
In a bid to spend his remaining days outside of prison, he struck a deal for immunity and became a witness to the murders. He pointed the finger at George Weathern's ranch, where Weathern lived with his wife. A raid was conducted on the ranch and drugs, weapons, and bodies were discovered. George and his wife were promptly arrested. The police continued searching the ranch for about a week, suspecting that there might be up to 12 more bodies buried there. After his arrest, George decided to become a state witness. In exchange for revealing the location of the bodies on his ranch, he was granted immunity. George went on to testify in court against Hells Angels members who were allegedly involved in the murders. As a result, he and his wife, along with their two children, were placed in a witness protection program. Currently, George's whereabouts are unknown. However, he has written a book called Wayward Angel, which provides insights into his life with the Hells Angels and his journey of becoming a state witness, testifying against his fellow brothers, and entering the witness protection program. Now, don't be surprised when I tell you that the Angels have been involved in more than one massacre. The bodies buried on that ranch were just the tip of the iceberg compared to what we're about to uncover. Number 7. Michel Jean Genet 1985. A shocking and brutal event unfolded in a quiet town in the eastern townships of Quebec. The notorious Hells Angels called upon five of their members only to have them mercilessly slaughtered. The incident took place inside the Hells Angels bunker, located on a wooded hill in a town near Sherbrooke. It was there that the five members of the gang's now defunct Laval chapter met their tragic fate. Two other members of that same chapter were also intended targets that day, but they failed to attend the meeting, sparing their lives. To dispose the bodies, they were callously dumped in a river, wrapped in sleeping bags and weighed down with cinder blocks and weights. This gruesome act became known as the Lennoxville Purge, forever etching its place in Quebec's history. And surprisingly, rather than marking the beginning of the end for the Hells Angels in Quebec, this tragedy only strengthened their presence in the years that followed. In 1985, the Hells Angels formed partnerships with other criminal organizations, such as the West End Gang and the Mafia. These groups were all about business and expected the same level of professionalism from their associates. As Hells Angels got involved in multi-million dollar drug deals, they realized they couldn't afford any mistakes. So they decided it was time for a cleanup, leading to the Lennoxville Purge. And unfortunately, the five members who lost their lives that day were not the last to suffer such a fate. April 7th, 1985, Claude Roy, who was linked to the Laval chapter, was killed by Hell's Angel Michel Jean Genet. Genet was also involved in the Lennoxville Purge. During his testimony, he confessed that he killed Roy because he broke the Hells Angels rules against using hard drugs like cocaine and heroin, and he was also suspected of being a police informant. And now that we learned about the guy doing all the dirty work, let's shift our focus to the guy calling the shots. Number 8. Michel Langlois Michel Sky Langlois was one of the founding members of the Popeyes Biker Gang, which later merged with the Hells Angels in 1977. Sky was involved in some serious criminal stuff, like drug trafficking and contract killings, all on behalf of the gang. The early 1970s, the Popeyes joined forces with the Dubois brothers and got into some intense clashes with rival biker gangs, including the Devil's Disciples and Satan's Choice. But the Popeyes came out on top and took control of the drug trade in their area. Once the merger with the Hells Angels went down, Langlois became the big boss of the club in Quebec. He was in charge of making the Hells Angels grow in the province and expand their criminal activities to other parts of Canada. Around that time, his biggest rival was the Montreal North Chapter, led by Evie Labosse Biteau. Members of that chapter were known for their violent ways and heavy drug use. Sky and the other leaders were worried about how their behavior was affecting the club's operations, so they simply decided to get rid of the Montreal North Chapter. This decision led to the Lennoxville Massacre in March 1985, where five members of the chapter were killed. July 1985. Langlois got arrested, but he managed to get out on bail. He became a fugitive and escaped to Morocco, where he lived in hiding for two years before finally giving himself up to the authorities in 1988. 
He pled guilty for accessory to murder and got only a slap on the wrist with a two-year prison sentence. After getting out, he maintained his involvement in criminal activities and was once again arrested in 2018 as part of a drug trafficking investigation. As if this guy wasn't enough, the Hells Angels were home to truly terrifying people. And the next person on this list just happens to be one of them. Number 9. Eve Apache Trudeau February 4th, 1946, a man named Eva Trudeau came into the world. Little did anyone know that he would later become known as the Apache, a notorious outlaw biker and contract killer who would earn his place among Canada's most infamous and prolific serial killers. Trudeau's rise to fame began when he joined the Hells Angels and eventually became their top assassin. He found himself caught up in numerous biker conflicts, such as the Popeye's Devil's Disciples War, the Satan's Choice Popeye's War, and the Quebec Biker War. His descent into a life of crime was fueled by his addiction to cocaine and a growing paranoia that his fellow gang members were out to get him. 1985, after the horrific Lennoxville Massacre, Trudeau decided to become a crown witness and provide crucial information about organized crime activities. In return for his testimony, he received a lenient sentence of life in prison with the possibility of parole after just seven years. Insane, I know. 1994. Trudeau was granted parole and given a new identity, Dennis Kuti. However, his freedom was short-lived as he was arrested in 2004 for assaulting a young boy, resulting in an additional four-year prison sentence. 2006, Trudeau's life took another tragic turn when he was diagnosed with bone marrow cancer. He was transferred to a medical center where he eventually passed away in 2008. Number 10. Robert Chico Mora Before Hells Angels arrived in Arizona, the Dirty Dozen Motorcycle Club, led by Robert Chico Mora, ruled as the state's most ruthless and feared biker gang. The Dirty Dozen was a wild and unruly club known for its black and white patch, which struck fear in the hearts of law enforcement and regular bar goers. Shootouts, drug use, and wild parties were a regular occurrence for the Dozen. 1977, the Dirty Dozen made a monumental decision, joining forces with the Hells Angels. Chico Mora played a crucial role in advocating for this merger, aiming to unite his fellow members with the larger worldwide brotherhood of the Hells Angels. Mora's reputation for ruthlessness and criminal activities had earned him both respect and notoriety. He had a manslaughter conviction for a shooting incident in 1980, and a lengthy rap sheet that included drug trafficking and illegal weapons possession and his reputation as a feared biker and his brutal nature remain legendary within the club. He was known for his physical strength, involvement in fights, and his intimidating presence. People often said about him, Never mess with Chico. He would kill anyone. A cop, woman, child, dog, bunny rabbit, even a Hells Angels brother if he had to, without losing a wink of sleep. January 1st, 2014, Chico Mora passed away, and his funeral was a testament to his influence, with a large gathering of Hells Angels paying respects to a man who left an unforgettable mark on Arizona's biker scene. Number 11, Kadir Padir, January 10th, 2014. Something shocking went down at the bookies. Tahir Ozbek, a 26-year-old man just minding his own business playing cards, had his life cut short. The security camera caught it all, 13 men sneaking in through the back entrance, some of them wearing masks. While most of the attackers were busy keeping the other customers in check, one of them pulled out a gun and fired off eight shots. Unfortunately, six of those bullets found their mark on Port Tahir, leaving him dead on the spot. It all happened so fast, just a matter of seconds. But thanks to the footage, the police managed to round up most of the culprits involved. Turns out the leader of the Hells Angels in Berlin, Kadir Padir, had ordered the hit as payback for Tahir stabbing one of his crew members, a bouncer at a nightclub, in Alexander Platz back in October 2013. Padir was one of 11 people convicted of this murder. Seven of them were found guilty of committing this murder together, including Kadir himself. The Hells Angels' ruthlessness is not limited solely to their rivals. Sometimes, it even extends to their loved ones. Number 12. Zane Peora Wallace 
July 31st, 2019, Jasmine Wilson was barely recognizable as she lay dying in her hospital bed. The poor 30-year-old mother of two was covered in bruises from head to toe, her body a canvas of black and blue. She also had multiple fractured ribs. It was clear that she had been enduring months of relentless beatings. Tragically, two days later, Jasmine's life support was switched off. The police officer assigned to her case was appalled by the severity of her injuries, saying that there were some of the worst he'd ever witnessed. Now you might be thinking that Jasmine was kidnapped and tortured by a sadistic murderer. But no, the person responsible for her torment was her own boyfriend, Zane Peora Wallace. Wallace was a member of the Hells Angels chapter in New Zealand. This guy had a long history of violence with previous convictions for assaulting his past partners dating all the way back to 2014. November 2018 The abuse inflicted by Wallace on poor Jasmine began with a terrifying incident. He forced her to pull over while they were driving in Wanganui, snatched her keys, and brutally kicked her in the chest. This was just the beginning of a nine-month nightmare for Jasmine. Not only did Wallace repeatedly attack her during this period, but he also assaulted one of Jasmine's acquaintances. And if that wasn't enough, he went on to assault two people at a party in August 2019, just before he was finally arrested for Jasmine's murder. It's worth mentioning that Wallace had spent quite some time behind bars in two different prisons throughout 2019. Despite being fully aware that prison phone calls are recorded, he shamelessly made threats against Jasmine and her family on multiple occasions. He didn't hold back, openly stating that he would slap, kick, bash, and even saying on one occasion she was going in the ground. And on many occasions, he described in explicit detail how he would kill her. July 30th, 2019. The fatal attack all started with a big argument. Things escalated quickly when he punched her in the head, not once, but multiple times. And the violence didn't stop there. The very next day, he attacked her again. This time, he shoved her so hard that her head smacked against the wall. It was so forceful that she went limp, completely knocked out. In a panic, he reached out to his father for help. And that's when things took a more twisted turn. His father, Stephen Wallace, came to the rescue. He found Jasmine and quickly put her in a car. Then he contacted Zane Wallace's mother, Leanne Wallace who wasted no time reaching out to Zane's sister, Stevie Lee Wallace. It was definitely a family affair, but not in a good way. Together, the trio worked tirelessly to hide any evidence of where Jasmine was found and how she was taken to the hospital. They were determined to throw the police off their tracks. Stevie Lee Wallace even went as far as telling different stories to the hospital staff about how Jasmine got her injuries to misdirect the police investigation for a while. Wallace's parents and sister were already in hot water for trying to cover up the crime. They'd been sentenced for perverting the course of justice in relation to Jasmine's murder. And justice eventually caught up with Wallace. He was sentenced to life imprisonment with a minimum term of 15 years and 6 months. And number 13. Jonathan Nelson, Russell Taylor Ott, and Brian Wayne Went. Things would take a dark turn during a wild motorcycle event in Laconia, New Hampshire. Joel Silva, a Hells Angels Sonoma Charter member, got into a heated confrontation with a fellow member from the Hells Angels Salem Charter. This disrespectful act didn't sit well with Jonathan Nelson, the president of the Fresno Charter, Brian Wayne Went, the president of the Salem Charter, and Russell Taylor Ott, the president of the Sonoma Charter. They felt that Silva needed to pay the ultimate price. July 15th, 2014. Silva was tricked into going to Fresno Hells Angels Clubhouse, where Went coldly shot him in the back of the head. Silva's body was cremated at a local facility the following day, while his truck was set ablaze. Now, fast forward to 2022, when the trial took place. Jonathan Nelson, Rusty Ott, and Brian Went were found guilty of Silva's murder. They confessed that Silva had been attacked because he had been involved in an affair with Raymond Fox's wife. Fox, a long-standing member of the club with a notorious criminal past, and the three men felt they needed to avenge his honor. As a result of their heinous crime, the trio was sentenced to life in prison. And so, locked away in the depths of prison, they stand as a chilling reminder that even within the tight-knit brotherhood of the Hells Angels, 
Betrayal and vengeance know no bounds.